Good afternoon. I'm Dave Webb, Director of Campus Engagement here at Mondavi Center. And thank you for coming uh, today for what's the final uh, presentation in the forum at MC, a series of uh, free events contextualizing the arts at UC Davis. Um, the, today's program is entitled Cinema Diaspora with Mira Nair. Now I'd like to introduce the panelists for this uh, final forum at MC presentation for the year. Tonight's, today's panel discussion is being moderated by Dr. Gayatri Gopinath. Uh, she's an associate professor of women and gender studies at UC Davis. Her work on gender, sexuality, and South Asian diasporic film, music, literature has appeared in numerous journals and anthologies. Her book, Impossible Desires, Queer Diasporas and South Asian P Public Cultures was published in 2005 by Duke University Press. Um, joining her is Dr. Julie Wyman. She is a filmmaker and media artist whose work aims to expand and complicate our understanding of gender, the body, and the way that power works. Uh, her full-length documentary, A Boy Named Sue, aired nationally on Showtime and MTV's Logo Network. And her other short films have been shown in festivals, theaters, and museums internationally. Uh, currently, she's working on a full-length documentary about America's number one ranked weightlifter, Cheryl Howarth. And today's special guest, Mary Nair, is that rare director whose films are both compelling meditations on important ideas and brilliant entertainment. Uh, with her unique point of view, she has tackled the big issues of race, class, sexuality, intergenerational strife, and cultural appropriation. From the Oscar-nominated Salome Bombay to her most recent film, The Namesake, which, as we all know, is receiving tremendous critical and popular acclaim. Uh, Nair's other films include Mississippi Masala, Kama Sutra, and Vanity Fair. She also directed the India segment on the September 11th movie, 110901. Mira Nair is currently a mentor in film at the prestigious Rolex Protégé Arts Initiative, joining fellow mentors David Hockney uh, and Mario Vargas Losa to help guide young artists in critical stages uh, of their artistic development. Nair's next film, Shantaram, starring Johnny Depp, is scheduled to begin shooting this fall. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. So uh, thank you all for being here. And we do, since this is a small, smallish crowd, we really hope that this can be as interactive as possible. Um, so maybe we'll start, Mira, by talking about the question of genre because I was really struck by how you started your career as a documentary filmmaker and um, then moved to fiction, but you never really left documentary behind. You've sort of gone between the two. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that strikes me about your fiction films is how in some ways you do have a documentary sensibility to a certain extent in some mm -hmm. of them. So maybe we can talk about that connection. And Julie, as a documentary filmmaker, maybe you can also sort of jump in in terms of you know, your sort of vision of um, Mira's films. So, so I'm the, yeah. I'm the yeah, vision here. You're here kind right. of in the middle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I get the drift now. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I never, I, I never thought I would be a filmmaker and I never thought that film mm -hmm. actually was a, going to be a, or was a serious mode of expression growing up mm -hmm. in Orissa as I did in a tiny place in mm. India um, where we had one movie theater and it showed one movie all the time, mm. Dr. Zhivago, you know, perpetually, <laughs> perennially, with or without sound. We had Omar Sharif in his crystallized icicles. Um, but uh, so, you know, for mm -hmm. me, movies were only came much later and not with any kind of, you know, pointed, mm -hmm. I've got to become a filmmaker type of thing. Mm -hmm. The first inspiration really was life, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, originally kind of what we call in India Jatra, you mm -hmm. know, mythological theater that mm -hmm. travels from mm -hmm. village to village and speaks the oral histories in great uh, high, you know, big dramas mm -hmm. about good and evil mm -hmm. uh, made with nothing, mm -hmm. made with very few props mm -hmm. and a couple of actors. Um, and those were the things that completely, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely captured my imagination as a kid growing up in a small town in which not much else happened. Mm -hmm. um, so first it was this p theater, which then I began to get drawn to myself as an mm -hmm. actor, you know, mm -hmm. in school, very amateur, but then spent a couple of serious years in the theater mm -hmm. in Calcutta and in Delhi mm -hmm. uh, with sort of the political theater, more mm -hmm. experimental theater, theater that uh, protested Vietnam or th protested political apathy, or, you know, themes that were happening at mm -hmm. that time. Um, but 
it was under the illusion that I was an academic that I applied to mm -hmm. scholarships in, mm -hmm. in this country and I got one uh, to come to Harvard. And uh, there, it was Oklahoma playing all the time on, you know, on the main <laughs> stage, you know. And I, the, the whole world of hoop skirts and musicals had no relation, I had no mm -hmm. relationship to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, and actually that's what led me to come to New York City mm -hmm. and work at La Mama and look mm -hmm. at the heroes of like Joe Chaikin mm -hmm. and Peter mm -hmm. Brook and mm -hmm. various uh, people uh, whom I just used to observe. So the, the first, uh, when I had to go back to the university, the thing that was closest to my interests was documentary filmmaking that they offered. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was lucky because I could work with Ricky Leacock and mm -hmm. later D.A. Pennybaker, you know, both mm -hmm. sort of real legends who had created the Cinema Verite form as we know it, Cinema Verite being, of course, the truth of life, uh, but, but to document this truth of life in an un, unmanipulated way, you know. Mm. So it was that kind of cinema that I made for about seven years after graduation, living in New York City but working in India. Um, and I must say, it was, it's an extraordinary um, exercise, you know, just to observe or to capture how life can be, how the ordinariness of life can be so extraordinary. And that uh, has definitely and deeply affected how I treat, you know, fiction mm. films later mm. on. Uh, because I believe that if you don't create that foundation of truth, which is usually for me born out of an authenticity, you know, then the audience will basically not go with you, you know. So it is that uh, that I constantly try to preserve in a lot of films, even though I've made period films and fabulous films and mm. films that are not necessarily grounded in any reality that you or I know. But still, mm. that truthfulness, whether it's an elusive thing, but I believe that um, the audience understands truth and trusts you if you are truthful. Mm. And you can achieve that truth so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And of course, mm -hmm. what is truth, we mm -hmm. can also discuss, you know. But that is what I aspire mm. to make. So, so um, you know, one of the sort of traditional functions of documentary, even in the work of Leacock and Pennebaker and things like that, is to um, have this sort of to represent the unrepresented, to have sort of a social function or commentary, and to have sometimes, especially more in more the sort of more recent popular documentary, a, a politics. And I see those strands working in your films, but I'm wondering if you can sort of speak specifically of how you see your fictional films, um, where, where sort of the, how they kind of express a politics or a social commentary. Well, actually, the original thought, the original question from the beginning, even when I was in theater only, was, is it possible that art can change the world or affect the world in any kind of direct way? And, um, and that it was the premise of my first feature film, which was Salam Bombay, mm -hmm. about, uh, again, it was kind of a coming full circle of working in the political theater that mm -hmm. I had worked in. Um, and I should say at this point that the reason I went towards making fiction, as opposed to mm -hmm. remaining in documentary, was this great uh, impatience with not having an audience, even though I was supposedly mm -hmm. successful and going to film festivals and selling to television occasionally and so on. But I had no real sense of who I was reaching. And, mm -hmm. and I really, the, the struggle to make a documentary film was a hundredfold more uh, to get an audience for that documentary film. And so that was what led me to making fiction, you know, to making Salam Bombay as fiction. And it was very clearly right from the beginning about whether we could actually impact the situation of street kids in our society, you know. Um, so that was a way of coming full circle from the political theater that had, I had begun in, but in, that we, in this film we were using real street kids. Mm -hmm. I was working with street kids, 24. We had 130 kids in the beginning and then whittled them down to 24 and then worked in a workshop for about eight weeks in Bombay. Uh, cast about two professional actors who would come in and you know, be in their roles and so on. Anyway, we had, we had done this and the whole premise from the beginning of it was um, 
try to find a street kids organization that we supported, that we believed in Bombay or somewhere in India, so that we could uh, use this film to support that, that organization. But what we felt was that there was nothing there that, that looked at these children like we looked at them, and, mm -hmm. or, and like the children looked at themselves. Mm -hmm. There was no place uh, that gave these children a right to be a child. There was no place that honored them. There was, no, you know, it, there was, it was all kind of this rehabilitation idea. Mm -hmm. We bring them in, wash them up, give them dinner, and then say la vie. You know, that's mm -hmm. it. You know, mm -hmm. and so the whole. And also, an amazing thing happened when the day uh, we began shooting Salam Bombay. I read in the newspaper in Bombay that the child who played Pishot in mm -hmm. Hector Babenko's amazing film, which really inspired me to make Salam Bombay in mm -hmm. India, the child who played Pishot had just been shot or killed mm. in a shootout in Brazil. Mm. And I just thought that was like a call mm. or sort of like a real sobering you know, reminder that to make a fiction film about street kids playing themselves isn't a simple idea. You have to create a cocoon, create a base for where these kids are not going to become, you know, just out there. So this idea of a longer term relationship with the children. Um, mm. And as it happened, uh, we made this trust called Salam Balak Trust, which is Balak means child, uh, a month after we finished the film. And of course, the film became a real, you know, phenomenon uh, as soon after. And so we had some resources and so on. And now we are in our 19th year of this trust, Salam Balak. We have 21 centers of street kids in three different cities in India. We have more than 5,000 children street kids coming through our centers, and we have a number of our kids who are now in the movie, who are now adults with their own children, who work with us in these centers. And we have directly impacted government policy uh, on street kids. And it's rare that this can happen, even in my work after that. It, ha it has happened, well, there's another example I can give you, but it's very rare to have that privilege where you can take a film that keeps lasting and actually impact mm -hmm. the government and impact a kid's life, or in this case, many kids' lives. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the, that was the um, drive. But I have a number of friends who are political filmmakers, you know, who sort of say mm -hmm. that they are and that's what they are. And I ha have many arguments with them because mm -hmm. I often find that their work is less intelligent than they are you know, mm. is, 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 is <laughs> agitprop, what I would call agitprop, or preaching to the converted, will, won't, it will not find an audience beyond those who will know to look for it in such and such person's work or whatever. And that's not what I'm interested in doing. I'm interested in, you know, populism. I'm interested in getting the people to wake up a different way. And sometimes, some films are not only about that, some films are about other things, but certain films with certain subjects, like street kids and so on, I really want to like, make you see the world anew. You know? So that was the impetus. Mm. And uh, so I think uh, knowing and coming from Cinema Verite is a, is a, is a big w reason that I'm continuing to uh, you know, uh, uh, go back to that uh, center of does it affect anybody, does it change anything? And also, it gives me a really good barometer about what not to do as a creative, a creative person. You know, when I get offered uh, films, uh, I always, from the outside, not those that I originate, which is mostly what I do is what I originate, but when I get offered films, I always ask myself this extremely humbling question, which is, can anyone else make this film? Mm. And if I can say, to, if I can think of people who can make that film, I never make it because other people can make it. I'm here because I have a point of view. I have a certain sensibility that maybe everyone doesn't have. Mm. So I should, you know, and making films, as we all know, mm. it's just such an obsessive task. And it's, it's a task that takes you away from other things that you may love, you know, like your family and whatever, <laughs> you know. So it's a very, um, for me, it's very important what I choose to put my mind in. You know, mm -hmm. I was, for instance, Devil Wears Prada. I was offered that film, and I thought, okay, I like <laughs> shoes, but you know, two years to get excited about Jimmy shoes, I, I can't. I, I won't. I'll kill somebody. You know, so that's the problem. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. So, you know, you've talked about this question of audience, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that because. You know, your films are shown in a variety of different mm -hmm. contexts, national contexts, but also in terms of who, you know, th the ways in which different audiences can access your films is, I yeah. think, qu quite interesting. Um, and, you know, I was struck, for instance, I, I recently saw The Namesake, and I was struck by the sort of Bengaliness of it, you mm -hmm. know, the specificity of this kind of Bengali community, and I was thinking, 
that, um, you know, if I were a sort of Bengali diasporic person, I would be able to access that text in a particular way. Um, and I was really struck by one moment in the film where the, the, an interaction between Gogol and his Bengali girlfriend, mm -hmm. wife, is actually not translated. Mm -hmm. You know, you leave that moment untranslated. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, you have multiple audiences in mind mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And so how do you sort of think about that, the question of audience? And well, um, I try to play it every way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. In the sense that I really have a high barometer for a tone in one's work that explains our culture. Mm -hmm. I can't bear that. I can't be here to be an ambassador mm -hmm. of my culture, even though many people think I am, but I'm not interested in that mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. to be an ambassador means I'm teaching, means I'm diplomatic, means I'm pleasing everyone, mm -hmm. and I'm not interested in that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also have a very, uh, I have a cute sensitivity to making films that will explain to the West what we mean, why is this red dot, what is this, I can't crap, it's just crap for me, I can't bear it. <laughs> it's boring and it means that your point of view is the West or the point mm -hmm. of view is the person mm -hmm. who doesn't know you, mm -hmm. you know. So my, my challenge or my interest is in finding a way where, mm -hmm. as you said, you, you know, ha, uh, the Bengali person in the audience mm -hmm. will feel completely at home or secure with my mm -hmm. intention mm -hmm. and the non-Bengali person perhaps trusts me that I'm giving them a world in which uh, is truthful or, and if it is truthful, and this is something that I see a lot, if it is truthful, they see themselves mm -hmm. in it. Whether mm -hmm. they are from Hungary or Iceland, mm -hmm. they see themselves in it. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. And I feel mm -hmm. that the key to that is uh, to mm -hmm. overuse the word truth, you know, mm -hmm. is, is to make it in such a way that you recognize yourself in it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not interested in, you know, I, that's why, you know, namesake is 40% in Bengali, mm -hmm. you know, or, or monsoon wedding was three languages in one sentence, because mm -hmm. that's how we speak and that's mm -hmm. how we think, mm -hmm. you know. But the way to do that uh, is usually to go under the radar. Like, usually you can do those things if you don't have millions of dollars and lots of mm -hmm. men in suits following you and saying, three languages? How am I going to subtitle that? Who am I going to sell it to? What's the distributor? They're going to drive you nuts. So you make it inexpensively. You make it independently. Mm -hmm. You make it like you want to make it. And then, as in the case of that film, it becomes a, a hit, a commercial mm -hmm. hit. And then the people understand that, oh, it, there isn't just one way to make a film. Mm -hmm. There are many ways to make a film mm -hmm. that, uh, that reaches people, mm -hmm. you know. What about, um, are there times when you sort of speak with an audience or with individual people and feel like, um, I'm just wondering if, you know, how you feel your films are received and understood or misunderstood if they are and what sort of some of the challenges of that are, of that sort of speaking to many places at once or crafting a film in that way? You know, I have to say that, uh, that my films are a result of my own sensibility and my sensibility, if you look at it from the beginning, uh, as you must know, I mean, in India, we are raised with a worldview, you know? We are not raised like uh, loads of people, I mean, in America is not raised with a worldview. You know, you don't know what's happening. You don't know, in, right. only now do they know where Afghanistan is, right. you know? Uh, so the, the, the thing is that I came here knowing all the lyrics of the Beatles, for instance. You know, it's something that you don't expect an Indian kid to know. You know, but we know all those things. So, we, it's so, so firstly, you're raised with the worldview. Then when I came here when I was 19, I've lived in these two cultures, now three, because I live in Africa as much of my life uh, as I do in India or here, um, for a long time. And so it's very interesting when the goalposts shift, you know, when you're not just looking to one audience. You are actively living in many cultures, like I do. Um, the other thing is um, cinematic vocabulary. You know, that is something that is so different. Uh, I mean, I'm not reared, I love Bollywood to some extent and all, but I'm not reared in that Bollywood filmmaking mm -hmm. culture, you know, of the long three and a half hour overdrawn, easy to understand, you know, sort of sl slightly melodramatic thing. Um, my, I guess, influences are more European, equally Indian and European and so on, you know. So they've always been sort of interwoven without me really actively knowing how they have become that way, yeah? Um, then what I also do is I, uh, I subject my rough cuts to a lot of people, you know? And I, I learn a lot about that, you know? I'll give you an example in the namesake. Um, 
we were showing a rough cut and, and, and to strangers, often to strangers, because uh, that's what's most interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And a woman said to me, um, you know, I would love to know what Gogol wrote, you know, or what is the overcoat and what, you know, what is that story that, that, that inspires this main character to such an extent. I had, it was not in the book, Jhumpa's book, mm. it was not anywhere, and I thought that's really interesting to put an audience through two hours <laughs> of understanding what is the overcoat, I mean, mm. of speaking about the overcoat, but you don't know what the overcoat mm -hmm. is. So it gave me the idea to have Gogol read the actual Nikolai Gogol's overcoat mm. as, as, as in the last coda of the movie. It's a small mm. thing, but it's a big thing, you mm -hmm. know, when you understand what an, I mean, I listen to audiences as well, mm. you know. But I don't um, cater, you know. I try not to cater because that's right. just like, then you become like anyone, I suppose, you know. And I try not to cater and I try not to explain, you know, mm -hmm. because I feel like people should, uh, you know, reach the bar, you know, mm -hmm. educate themselves or whatever. Understand that we are not all American or we are not all one thing, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, you know, I really appreciate what you said about not wanting to be the cultural ambassador. Yeah. Um, but there's a way in which I think you are positioned as know. one, you know, Alas. and so your films do become representative yeah. in a certain way. Mm. And um, you know, I, I was I was reading Julie and I were uh, noticing that your latest project is in fact a, you're taking a, a Bollywood film and sort of is it a kind oh, of remake that one, right? Uh -huh. I'm so not doing that anymore. Oh, but you're not. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, okay. I'm producing it, but I'm not directing it. Right. Yeah, because okay. I'm doing Shantaram. But, but, oh, okay. uh, but I am. It's it's in the works, but I'm not right. uh, helming it, as okay. they say. Yeah. Okay. But I'm very interested in it. I, I mean, know. I, yeah. So I, I guess the thing I was thinking is, you know, how do you sort of take on that mantle to a certain extent and sort of translate a particular cultural mm -hmm. idiom or cinematic vocabulary into another one, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is there a way in which you find yourself having to play a kind of cultural translator, even if you're sort of resistant to that role? Yeah. Or no, I mean, I, yeah. uh, like that's, uh, mm -hmm. you're referring to Munna Bhai MBBS, mm -hmm. which is a big blockbuster, comic mm -hmm. blockbuster in India, mm -hmm. which my son loves and I love. And mm -hmm. uh, I had just had this idea to make it as an African-American version with mm. Chris Tucker oh. in Harlem. And uh, Chris Tucker is a kind of god in our family. So, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, and so, I do have these ideas right. and I do have people who listen to my ideas weirdly enough mm -hmm. and so then we get cracking into trying mm -hmm. to do exactly your mm -hmm. question, you know, mm -hmm. how do you do that? And it's not so simple, mm -hmm. which is why it's not yet been made, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. again, uh, you know, Hollywood, that was a Hollywood, right. I mean, we were positioning it, it was 20th Century Fox and all, blah, blah, all of that, you know, so they have certain criteria, you know, what becomes a cross, what right. becomes a mainstream thing. I have certain criteria and you know, trying to make that work, and it's not so simple, because uh, comedy is, is a very tricky thing, you know. Yeah. Um, and we kept trying, but it didn't, it hasn't yet fully worked, right. but uh, then I've been offered Shantaram, which is much more my cup of tea than, than that, mm -hmm. you know, because eventually I used to ask myself that, um, you know, ultimately, even if I succeed with Munna Bhai, which is called Gangster MD in our mm. in our uh, in our version, um, it's just a remake. You know, it's just mm. a remake. So I I don't want to spend so much time. You know, ultimately just remaking something. Mm -hmm. You know, it was more like a spark of inspiration for my son, who is was 14 when I started. He's already 16. He's already you know Over passed it. on. You know, <laughs> so it's right. a little bit uh, yeah. uh, hard to keep the uh -huh. energy yeah. because it is two different vocabularies yeah. at that time. Yeah. You know? yeah. Julie, you had a question about sort of um, Mira's sort of um, positioning in relation to sort of Hollywood as an industry or um, sort of the limits of that or well, the Well, I mean, I th I, one of the things I was also mm -hmm. just thinking about, you're, you, one of the really beautiful consistent threads which gets, you know, written and commented about is the, the sort of Se the, the sort of consistently sensual, beautiful um, use of color and, um, mm -hmm. you know, pleasure. Like, that seems like that's, <laughs> that runs throughout. And yet, you know, a lot of the... Um, I mean, I think you've commented on this a little bit, that, mm -hmm. that in, in some ways, uh, maybe this is this preaching to the converted, that sometimes political mm -hmm. film is more of a... has an anti-aesthetic, has a... or like a Brechtian approach so mm -hmm. to, to, to get, putting the audience at a distance and thereby you think about it rather than diving Feel in, rather uh -huh. than feeling it. And, and I, I, I wondered 
you know, in terms of your choice to use that invitation and that access. Um, you know, and, and also one thing I, I, I love, and maybe this connects to that too, is the way that you use time and create these moments that are mm -hmm. these sort of almost suspension of, um, I don't know if they're like, mm -hmm. you consider them interior moments, but the, towards the beginning of Monsoon Wedding, the, um, the uh, manager Kent. character eats the marigold and the mm -hmm. marigolds are falling over his mm -hmm. Head, mm -hmm. the petals, or which which is completely set up as a as a uh, material reality in that scene that those flowers are there, they're easy to knock over, but it creates it kind of steps out of reality mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. Or in the beginning of the Perez family, the um, there's a scene on the beach where we see these people walking into the water, and it's really surreal. Mm -hmm. um, so there's these departures from mm -hmm. from reality, and I guess I'm curious about how you use those and that kind of beauty and launches, launching into the imagination, um, how those connect to the, your sort of what brought you into filmmaking? You know, for me, that is the joy of this great medium, that you can be so, it's such a plasticity. You know, if you like Rothko painting, you use it. You know, if you like a certain uh, monsoon wedding, that scene that you mentioned about the marigolds, it was also inspired by the song, a Muhammad Rafi old song that I used with as a background, you know, uh, mm. you know, aaj mausam bada hai. Mm. Today the mo today the weather is playing tricks on me, mm. and 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 I mean, in an Indian movie, it would not be used that way in a classic Bollywood movie at all. But I like to use whatever I love, you know, and and for me, it was a way to use that old song and to make something cinematically feel exactly as you felt it, apart from the foundation of quote, documentary reality, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just the beauty of cinema. I, I use it a lot. I use that kind of what I, we call ramping, you know, it's we change the, change the speed per frame while in the same shot, you know? So to give it that slightly otherworldly feel. And sometimes it's so subtle that you don't, uh, in hysterical blindness, I don't know if you've mm -hmm. seen it, it's a film with, uh, uh, you know, th there's the character of Jenna Rollins, this, this waitress mother who, unexpectedly finds love in a customer who comes to the diner and he passes away very suddenly and then she's walking and you know, serving her coffee and being her everyday waitress uh, self. And mm -hmm. I said to Jenna, you know, you are in a, th in this shot, you're in a trance of grief, you know. I'm gonna put the camera like literally in her calves. I always look at a waitress's calves because they're so, you know, st strong because mm -hmm. they're always on their feet. And mm -hmm. I was a waitress for many months, so I also know that. But, uh, but you know, just on her mm -hmm. feet and the way she would walk, uh, it would be like in a trance of grief because I understand what it feels like to lose someone. And when you mm -hmm. are doing something banal, like pouring coffee that you've poured for 20 years, something else happens when you've when you have a hole in your heart, you know? Mm -hmm. So I use that technique or that shot will come to me at that moment for that idea, you know? And... Um, it's just a way to subtly tell the audience, to, to have the audience, I suppose, enter the interiority of that person's pain or love or whatever. You know, that's what subjective. I love about it. Yeah, it's subjective. Yeah. It's completely subjective. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I've pretty much used that idea a lot of times, yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, it's different in each context, but it's just the beauty of this great medium. You know, mm -hmm. really, you can do so much with it. And a lot of people use a lot of gimmickry. I'm not much for gimmicks, but mm -hmm. it's a way for me to have you enter the soul or mm -hmm. try to have you enter mm -hmm. the soul mm -hmm. of the character. Yeah. You know, speaking of grief and loss, I think one of the most uh, moving things about the namesake is precisely that, that father character, mm -hmm. you know. And, and to me, one of the things that your films capture very beautifully is the sort of affect of exile, you know, mm -hmm. that, um, that sense of um, dislocation, um, trying to create a familiar world out of something completely unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there is that sort of melancholy mm -hmm. of exile mm -hmm. that, that that father character, I think, captures so beautifully. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you can speak to that a little bit, because um, in Mississippi Masala as well, you know, after I saw the namesake, it struck me that the the father in Mississippi Masala has mm -hmm. sort of a very similar relation to mm -hmm. Uganda. Mm -hmm. And um, so can you just kind of maybe talk about that, that sense of loss, of longing, mm -hmm. of nostalgia, I guess? 
Yeah. I mean, uh, the namesake, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in many ways is a experiential film. I want mm -hmm. you to experience it and it, this idea of loss or mm -hmm. melancholy. And, um, and the only way and the only reason I made that film was because I experienced it, mm -hmm. you know. And I never expected to. I lost someone very close to me mm -hmm. unexpectedly by malpractice in a hospital. And mm -hmm. next thing we know, we're burying her in a mm -hmm. snowstorm in New Jersey. Next day. You know, my mother-in-law who lived with us, we have three generations in our home, and she suddenly was not there, you know, and it was completely out of the blue and very, very unexpected. And it's terrible to bury someone who has never even known snow in their life, mm -hmm. you know, who's never known what it is to be in this a new country and to die in that new country. I just can't think of anything more painful. Uh, so it came from that experience. And I never, I was already going to do other movies. I was in other movies. I had never ex you know, expected, but it was such a stop to everything. And the melancholy was so all consuming that uh, I happened to read the namesake like six weeks into the morning. And I just dropped these two films and thought this was the one that I have to make. Mm. And I, I could not and would not have done it, mm. had, it not, had I not experienced it, it, experienced it. And so much of life, again, that comes back to Cinema Verite and comes back to what documentary teaches me all the time. So much of it is being fueled by what I see in life. Mm -hmm. you know? There was a moment um, when she went into a kind of distress and we had to mm. race her to ICU from her room in the hospital. It was like a ER or something. We were racing her. And then I had to go back to her room to close it because everything was in her room. And the room was a holy mess because they were administering to her in this room. There was nurses and tubes and everything like a typhoon. And then I opened her cupboard and there were her sort of tiny and perfect sort of Ferragamo little shoes, you know, <laughs> and her ty beautifully hung clothes and perfumed clothes. And I just had this feeling that she would never walk in them again. You know, it was just this feeling, even though she had not died at that time. Mm. And it was the memory of those shoes, you know, mm. that is in all over the namesake, you know, because all those things we do with shoes in the namesake is from this image and this emotion, yeah. you know. Otherwise, I would not have known how to do them, you know, how to, you know, have his, the father's shoes there and then have his son come and then put on his shoes and then walk in those. All that comes from life, mm -hmm. you know, not mm -hmm. anything. It's not even in the book. Mm -hmm. I think it's in the book that the shoes were lying there, but none of the episode that we make of it in the film. Mm -hmm. So I'm very um, porous about life, you know. I mean, that is really, um, ultimately, I hope, will always be my teacher. Mm. You know, yeah. you know uh, just to sort of continue on that, again, one of the most sort of um, wrenching scenes in, in the namesake is when the wife, Tabu, right, mm -hmm. r realizes that her husband is dead yeah. and she's in this sort of um, alien geographic landscape, but also an alien emotional landscape, right? Mm -hmm. And so she's She's standing there, it's Christmas, she's in the suburbs, and there's no one around her, and, mm -hmm. and so she's sort of wailing her grief, and there's literally no one there. Mm -hmm. And that sense of isolation, mm -hmm. um, um, contrasting so sharply with what her life would have been like had she stayed in Calcutta, mm -hmm. where the, the house would have been full <laughs> immediately. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm wondering if you can say anything more about that, that experience of isolation, that you know, seems to haunt these characters? Well, again, you know, f uh, mm -hmm. that's the privilege of mm -hmm. expressing oneself in cinema, mm -hmm. um, that these are like the example of the shoes. Uh, this is also a very personal mm -hmm. example mm -hmm. where um, I've lived here off and on for more than 20 years, but Christmas completely depresses me. Mm -hmm. I just can't bear it because mm -hmm. I have no relationship <laughs> to it and I never grew up mm -hmm. with it. And it's such a total commercial wave that, mm -hmm. you know, you're surrounded by these lights that insist on you to be happy. And the last thing you are is happy because you're so pressured. I just remember mm -hmm. in the, the subways with people carrying mm -hmm. all these Macy's presents. I mean, it's just so, you know, we all know how commercial and what a kind of, I don't know, it, it doesn't, it actually makes me deeply lonely mm -hmm. and alienated at Christmas, mm -hmm. particularly. <laughs> and um, and therefore, mm -hmm. and also because I love uh, the interpreter of melodies, mm -hmm. uh, Jhumpa Lahiri's first book of short stories, uh, and there's this fabulous uh, offbeat 
story about a girl who, uh, you know, who Twinkle, who uh, inherit, who buys a house and finds all mm. these icons in the house and these lights of Jesus and all of them. Anyway, it was on my mind, and so therefore, because I wanted to. Uh, exactly highlight her isolation and highlight the fact that you can scream in East Chester but no one's going to hear mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, the emotion is much more, uh, what do you call it, uh, much more reinforced if there would be Christmas lights mm -hmm. there because this is person, this, and this is, and th at the same time there's a, the paradox of being an immigrant mm -hmm. is that there's a Christmas tree in her house mm -hmm. and that's, there's a Christmas tree in her house because uh, Ashima, the character, mm -hmm. understands very early, it, it's in the mm -hmm. book as well, that if the, the children growing up in America feels deeply distanced and alienated if there's no Christmas in the house. So she understood very early on that she has to have a kind of Christmas thing going because it's a way of keeping the children at home, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. So I had the Christmas tree in the house and I had earlier before the husband dies when she's just knitting and so on, I had the neighbors, mm -hmm. uh, you know, put up the Santa Claus and sleigh and so on. And that's the other absurdity, you know, in these, <laughs> in suburbia, there are so many pink flamingos and so many, you know, Christmas and so much of this sort of mm -hmm. uh, surreal, ridiculous, mm -hmm. uh, you know, entire tableaus. So I wanted that mm -hmm. and because for me that is an embodiment of loneliness, you mm -hmm. know, and so therefore mm -hmm. I had to set it up, mm -hmm. you know, prior to that scene in which he dies mm -hmm. so that when she rushes out, and that's again in my imagination, not in the book, uh, but, uh, you know, I just, the notion of having, you know, suburbia all so mm -hmm. perfect, uh, but a woman in a, uh, you know, in an Indian sari, uh, you know, with snow on the, you know, bare feet and the way we live really, uh, but against this conformity of suburbia with Christmas lights. It's just a way that for me that would be the height of alienation mm -hmm. and the height of pain really. Mm -hmm. And so you know that's the great privilege of doing these kind of movies is that I bring what what makes me lonely mm -hmm. to that landscape mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and that's how it, it emerged mm -hmm. you know. It's interesting too because I can see how you sort of expanded on that. The, the book itself has the she puts new, on all the lights. Well, the, it's when she's writing yeah. the Christmas cards, or yeah. maybe there's a big thing about her writing these cards and signing the whole family's name, yeah. and then she gets that phone call. And yeah. So, and then you brought in your, you know, own sort of experience. Yeah, and, and the book is a wonderful detail she wrote about how after he, she hears that he is dead, she puts on all the lights in the house mm -hmm. and in the garage as if they were expecting company, uh, which I thought was an amazing detail. And that is really what that scene is about. But I thought, you know, uh, but what I added to it was not just this last shot of the house and the Christmas lights, but also a shot before that, which is that she stands in, in her garage, you know, as mm. the garage door goes up. Mm. And, you know, for me, it's such a, it's, I thought of American beauty, you know, mm. and all these American films where the garage, I mean, it's such an American place, right? Mm. In India or anywhere, you don't have a, a, a you know, garage like that. And so <laughs> what we did in that garage uh, was to put all, her life behind her, you know? Mm. So you have Gogol's baby carriage, you have the blankets that the children have worn, you have every, the bikes, you have the car, of course, you have all the stuff that, as an audience, you have seen this 30-year family in 30 years use, mm -hmm. you know? So that's behind her, her American life, you know? But the, the focus is on her feet, and then the, as, the, as the garage door goes, it goes mm -hmm. to a sari and then to her pain, and then she rushes out of the garage. But behind her, as she leaves the garage, I stay on the garage because uh, it's her life. It's that American life that's there, right there. Mm -hmm. And that's your life. You know, mm -hmm. that's your life mm -hmm. and your husband's gone and that's it. But that's what you have done is behind you here. It's right there in front of mm -hmm. you. And it's, uh, you know, that's, you know, seeing and living here gives you, gives me that in insight on what garages mm -hmm. mean mm -hmm. in, our, in our culture and in this mm -hmm. culture. And also as a kind of tongue in cheek reference to other American movies, mm -hmm. which you use garages in a completely different way mm -hmm. than, than this one. Mm -hmm. I'm really, I'm just, I'm interested in general in how, you know, one's career moves. I heard you give this speech once, um, it was a, a, actually a keynote speech where, um, which is a long story of why I heard this, but anyway, you were saying as, you know, one of your sort of those general, and yet you did it very nicely, very specifically, pieces of advice to the 
the, the, the graduating class t um, to not look at any stage as a um, stepping stone, yes. but to kind of um, fully invest in it because you don't know what river you're, you know, walking across or something. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in that in, in, in your life, both, you know, you kind of have talked about and described the way things have taken turns to where you are now, but also just what people learn when they're making films. And in specific, you know, so for example, in the namesake, what, what, did, what did you learn or what were challenges or what will you bring from that process into the things you're working on now? You want to know everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't want to reveal the no, trade no, no, secrets, I'm happy but to, I'm happy that's to. kind of what I'm getting at. Uh, yeah. But it's a, it's a sort of uh, all-encompassing question. Um, well, just to refer to the stepping stone uh, philosophy of mine, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, I think that filmmaking a lot of, uh, and a lot of stuff in, in this culture is a lot about uh, success and celebrity, you know, in the sense of how it is presented to the world, yeah? So a lot of young people get into this whole thing uh, thinking that they're just going to make it, you know? And I really find that attitude corruptive and completely false mm. in terms of <laughs> those are the kids who are never really going to get mm. anywhere because the conviction is missing in terms of what they're actually doing. And the, the, in the Bhagavad Gita, we have a saying which has deeply influenced me from the beginning, which is beware the fruits of action. You know, don't think of the fruits of the action, just commit yourself fully to the action. And um, that's where my philosophy comes from, where don't think of anything that you do as a stepping stone to something else, because sometimes you have no idea uh, where that will take you unless you're fully invested in it. Um, a case in point was um, Monsoon Wedding, you know, where, um, where um, I, I had raised, I had just finished Kama Sutra, this sort of mm -hmm. big epic film. I was very, kind of unhappy with how it had emerged and done, what, it, what, what it was. It was different from what I set out to do. And I was in a very lonely place about it. And we uh, spent about a year and a half developing a new, big, ambitious idea uh, called Bombay 2000. And I raised $8 million mm -hmm. for it. And I was uh, about to start making it when I looked at the script we had. And I felt it was just not right. And I returned the $8 million. And, and, and first time, and hopefully last time, I've done that, where I really kind of s s felt depressed for the first time in my life and um, came across a, a Fellini-esque sort of image of uh, 2,000 women in white crossing this highway, guffawing madly in Bombay. And I thought, am I seeing things? <laughs> and I looked at them and they were holding this placard saying, World Laughter Day. And I got out of my <laughs> taxi in the traffic jam and just followed them and discovered that there's this bizarre phenomenon called the Laughing Club mm -hmm. of India, where people come together and laugh for 40 minutes daily together. <laughs> and there are about 600 clubs like this and how it mm -hmm. becomes a support system and how it becomes a kind of village of uh, in a, in a metropol metropolis, you know. Interesting. So I ended up <laughs> making a film about this feeling like a real low, feeling so low myself and feeling like I wasn't capable of anything and uh, various big director friends of mine were having parties with stars and they wanted me to come and I would say, oh, I'm nothing, I can't come any, you know, <laughs> I was really feeling low. And I was doing this absurd documentary about, you know, people who take laughing seriously in a way to make myself not feel so low. And of course, made this movie, and it's a very, um, it's a documentary with, in the monsoon, uh, freewheeling camera, using Indian movie songs to tell you a portrait of the city and so on. And when we finished this film in six weeks, you know, using mm -hmm. mileage, using a friend's camera, like no money invested, we immediately like, um, sold it to HBO, had, had decent, very good success with it, but most importantly, it became a cinematic model of the style that became mm. Monsoon Wedding, mm. you know? That it was freewheeling camera, in the rain, old movie songs, all of the things that I learned, sorry, learned with, with the Laughing Club of India was used and came to real fruition in Monsoon Wedding. Mm. Now, I would not have known that I would not have known that. I would not have known that when I was feeling nothing, like nothing, mm -hmm. and making this film about people who laugh because they are in pain, you know? H had I, and I, had I not treated that really fully, I would not have crossed that step to what then would have become, became my most successful film. Mm -hmm. I mean, now Namesake is mm -hmm. probably more successful than that, but at that time. And, um, you know, 
how would I have known that, you know? And that's the exa a good example that I tell, you know, my students also and me, myself, you know, that you have to do whatever you're doing fully, otherwise, and if you don't do it fully, you don't know where it'll take you, you know? So, th that's one thing, but, um, the, the, s the second part of your question well, was, I, what did you I, learn in the name scene? Well, I, the, I, you gave actually a perfect example of what I was curious about yeah. in terms of a moment where mm -hmm. one thing became a lesson for another. Yeah. Um, so, you know. Well, <laughs> just, to, just to add a coda to that, you know, what it is is that inspiration is a very rare thing. And I have been through times in my life, not that much, thank God, but a couple of years, like this time that I'm telling you about, where I'm not inspired, where I was not inspired, you know. And so when I'm inspired, really charged to do something, like I was charged to do the namesake, mm -hmm. uh, just by that emotional state I was in and reading Chumpa's mm -hmm. exquisite writing and so on, I trusted that call, you know. I knew I had, I was fully financed, I was going to do Homebody Kabul, Tony Kushner's mm. play, which we had written the script for, it was all on my terms, very nice, but I said, you know, you know, I, if I don't seize this moment of inspiration now, mm -hmm. I won't do it, you know, mm -hmm. and I will be unhappy, mm -hmm. you know. So I have learned to value that, you know, and, and not to get seduced by the, by anything else, you know, because it's so easy to just join the lemmings and become another, you know, filmmaker, hack, you know, whatever, not to be, mm -hmm. not to be uh, known for what you bring to the screen, you know. Mm -hmm. But, um, and also you have to really have your mind right in terms of the success quotient or the, or the whole thing that people get off on, you know, is, mm -hmm. you know, that's what I, because they can buy you in many ways in my business, but mm -hmm. they can't buy integrity. Mm -hmm. And then when you have and express your integrity, they lie down, man, they kiss your feet. They say, oh, please do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, sorry, I'm just being <laughs> irreverent, but I'm truthful, I'm truthful. We yeah. could go on chatting, but I'd love to open it up to you all. We have about 10 minutes for Q&A, so um, there's a question there. Well, you know, I'm um, deeply, uh, deeply in love with music and I'm, um, Great uh, student, uh, not such a good student, but I'm a student of Indian classical music. I, s I have a teacher and we, s you know, I learn music, singing. Um, and the reason I made Tabu a singer in the namesake was because I wanted to use Indian classical music in the soundtrack. And my soundtracks, I work mm. harder on, I mean, as hard on my soundtracks as on the image of my mm -hmm. films. So I wanted to use classical music, uh, but also because Bengali families are are very culturally keyed in, and it's very normal for the girl to know, know music, the, the, you know, someone to paint, someone, you know, it's, it's perfectly normal. And for me, because I was making a 30-year saga in two hours, um, it, I, my intention has to be clear and everything has to propel the plot. So if I, for me to g make Tabu an amateur singer, Ashima an amateur singer, then would give me a way to have her after her husband dies and after she has to live her life again, to give her in singing uh, an idea of literally embodying her own voice or finding her own voice. And I like the idea of someone who is not a serious classical singer, but who has interest like she has in the beginning of the film, who then after marriage and moving to a distant country and all, how singing becomes like a lullaby or a comforting to your husband, a lullaby to your baby. You know, how you are, always we are taught to adjust. You know, women, we are taught so much to adjust. And I thought it would be very poignant to have this person who sings, but who has now reduced her singing to these familiar, familial things, and then to have her come back to her own voice. But all in spaces of a minute or two minutes, or, you know, not take a lot of time to do it. Because, so that's why, but it, it all comes from a love of the music not because of anything else. I love that music and I wanted to use that music. The question was, how do you take a sort of sprawling narrative like Shantaram and actually boil it down to a two-hour narrative? Um, I mean, yeah, Shantaram is a, what I call a doorstopper of a novel. <laughs> <laughs> it is vast. Um, 
I have to say at the outset that, um, you know, they already had Eric Roth, who is a great screenwriter, uh, you know, adapt it. They, there was a version of Shantaram before I was asked to direct it, you know. So that was one thing. But what I do, my way of doing it, for any novel, but for Shantaram specifically, because I'm deep in it, is I read and reread this novel and I marked uh, things. It could be phrases, it could be paragraphs, it could be pages uh, of what I really loved, you know what meant something. And I had uh, my assistant type up those pages because it's a huge novel and it's hard to, and I know it very well, but so this was the way I worked, which is, so I typed everything down to like 25 pages, you know, of things that I absolutely loved that made for me the cornerstone of this novel, yeah. And then I worked with the screenwriter um, and basically shaped the, shaped the tale that we wanted to tell. But in working and working and working, what the, the pleasure, again, for me, is to make sure that almost all of those 25 pages are what ends up in the screenplay for me, whether it be a moment or an expression or a situation or a character, whatever. Um, and, and that's really important because otherwise I have to, you know, uphold every page, you know, in, of the screenplay, you know. Um, and then, you know, and then it's, it's, it's really the art of screenwriting where you condense certain characters and make them one character or you decide to do away with this or that or the other. For me, you know, with Shantaram, it's, for those who don't know, it's a true story of a, a heroin addict who escapes from prison in Melbourne in Australia in uh, 1980 and who comes to Bombay to disappear. And in Bombay, he, because he has a, a first aid kit for himself, he's mistaken as a doctor in a slum and he chooses to stay in it in the slum because it's the most anonymous place there is uh, from the cops. And uh, he ends up sort of, even though he has no faith in himself, ends up feeling useful for the first time, positive about himself. And it's about a different series of great Indian characters who basically, uh, I think, in my opinion, uh, teach him what honor is, what, what we call is that, what honor is. And finally, through various uh, adventurous sort of things that he does by entering the Bombay underworld and various things that he does, he understands how to achieve that honor for himself. That is the path of, of this character. And that is really the plot of this story, which is a quite an untraditional plot as movies go. Um, so for me, again, the, I mean, and fortunately Gregory Roberts, who wrote this uh, book, um, is really an amazing character whom I've gotten to know very well, and he lives in Bombay now. He went and served his time in prison and then came back to Bombay, wrote this book in prison and then came back to Bombay where he lives now permanently. So he is generally a true embodiment of this East-West character. And um, I have to say that the draft that I first read before I was brought into it is a very different draft than what we've just finished together. Because, um, you know, people, if you don't know India uh, and you live in Malibu, it's a very different version of mm -hmm. India that you sort mm -hmm. of concoct up. And I feel so uh, honored and happy that I'm asked by Johnny to direct it uh, because it's about time we get that continuum between East and West correct for a change. And um, it's, it's so interesting in terms of what the point of view is about something. You know, I can mm -hmm. keep talking about it, but uh, if you want, I can. But uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you one example and then I'll stop. One, w one thing the screenwriter wrote uh, is there was this, there's this uh, sort of warrior, uh, Man Friday of the underworld leader, a guy called Nazir, and, and he, uh, you know, helps Lynn, the, the Johnny Depp's character, recover and heal from a terrible bout in prison. And in the, in the script that he had originally written, and, and uh, so one day, uh, Lynn is healing and waking up and hears this beautiful Chopin. This is in Bombay. And he walks out and he sees this Afghani warrior kind of character in pantaloons, in Indian salwar kurta kind of thing, playing Chopin on this piano. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, Lynn loves the music, washes over him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And two scenes later, they're in a car, and there's classical music again on the radio. And uh, the Johnny's character asks Nazir, "How did you learn music?" 
And Nazir says to him, well, my father was a traditional person who never liked music and my mother had this access to this piano in Kabul and she taught me music and, you know, and I could never play because my father would cut my hands off if I played and so on. And I'm looking at him and I'm saying, you know, what are you saying to me? You're saying to me that he may look like a barbarian, but he aspires to Chopin. Right, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and you know he had never looked at it that way. He'd never thought about it like that. But that is what you're saying: is that that is the standard is mm -hmm. Chopin, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm saying it would be highly unlikely to have a piano in Kabul. It would be highly likely to have this man come from an incredibly old tradition mm -hmm. of you know mo, you know Tan Sen's music or you know Mughals from the Mughal era. You would have music in in. We have music everywhere. Mm. It's, the, it's the perfume of where mm. we come from, you know. Mm. Um, so it could very easily be a sarod or probably mm. a sarod because mm. it's North Indian, Afghani kind of mm. uh, instrument. And so let's just turn it to have him play the sarod, mm. you know, and which is a beautiful thing. It's like mm. a cello, Indian cello. And then to not have this business of the father cutting hands off if you play music because that was the Taliban that would came after, you know. This is before, <laughs> you know. So to have the father actually descend from mm. Tan Sen, mm. to have the father be of that genealogy, which would be exactly the way it was, but to not play music because their country was now at war, you know, as a, as a protest, you know. So this is what now the film is, these are the scenes in the film. So Im imagine what a different message is being given to an audience, you know, when you hear Chopin versus you hear the Sarod, you know. What are you saying? You know, you're saying so much, mm. you know, but it's, a, it's just two scenes of a subsidiary character. But, but just to give you an example, you know, if you don't leave Los Angeles, you would think that Chopin is what mm -hmm. you aspire to. Which is a very, you know, it's a very dangerous thing because that's what's constantly happening in the revisiting of Iraq, in the revisiting of Vietnam, and in the revisiting of all of this, which is usually done by America, you know. We have the resources here to, to make movies about that, you know. We will never have the, res you know, and yet you will make 25 movies about Vietnam, but do we know the name of a Vietnamese character? We will not. Very rarely do we, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid we, I'd love to continue this conversation, but we're actually out of time. Um, so please join me in thanking Mira. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Thanks.